Good day and welcome to SEO Bricks Insight where we talk about what's really going on in the world of the Bricks. Now over the last 10 years the US has been attempting to isolate Russia and make it a pariah on the world stage with the help of its vassals and the useful idiots in the G7 and the EU. However these attempts have failed miserably just like their so-called shock and awe and sanctions from hell have. Now the main problem for the US is it's led by politicians who live in a bubble, get their information from so-called think tanks and <laughs> alleged experts, and it's people like Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken who are at best incompetent idiots who seem to think that threatening countries who don't follow US policy is somehow a form of diplomacy. Now you only have to look at how these clowns are received in places like China or Saudi Arabia compared with the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. They're treated with contempt where Lavrov is treated with reverence and respect. Now much to the annoyance of the US, G7 and EU allies, Russia has been forging strong bonds and trading ties with the so-called Global South with, a global, with the goal of establishing a new world multipolar order. To this end, it's leveraging the support of influential organisations like BRICS, which is already competing on an equal footing with the collective West in economic terms. Now, Moscow's stated objective is of building a multipolar world, which aligns perfectly with the aspirations of these and numerous other developing countries, who are weary of the dominance, audacity and the imposition of rules by their erstwhile colonial rulers. <clears throat> In addition to the propaganda expert, there's also the clearly expressed strategic element, and that's according to Sean McFay, who's a professor at Syracuse University in International Affairs. He believes that Moscow's broken out of what was a relatively weak ring of isolation with the help of its long-standing allies including China, North Korea and Iran, which are considered autocratic regimes in the West. It has also expanded and strengthened its relations with the large Asian countries which are considered democracies by Washington, Brussels and London, like India, Indonesia and Malaysia. Now before I continue I'd like to make an appeal. If you like and enjoy my videos, you can help me fund the channel and my website seobricksinsight.com to further develop it. You can do this by making a small donation which is done by clicking on the thanks button at the bottom of the video screen. And everybody who donates does get a personal thank you from me and I'm thanking you all just for watching because it's always great and to hear from you in the comments section. Now recently, following a visit and discussions in Mongolia, President Putin went with Umagan Karulesh, uh, the President of Mongolia. Now despite Mongolia's low profile on the international stage, this low-key trip attracted significant attention. I mean, Putin's visit to Alan Bator was a litmus test demonstrating the practical implication of the West isolation of Russia rather than just rhetoric. I mean, one of the outcomes of the diplomatic efforts in Washington is, is the issuance of an arrest warrant for the Russian president by the, <coughs> the International Criminal Court. This warrant obligates all International Criminal Court member countries to detain the president if he enters their territory. Now Mongolia is a member of the ICC, but the Mongolian authorities did not detain the Russian leader upon his arrival. Furthermore, they not only did they not arrest him, they gave him a full military honour warm welcome. And this was a snub to the US, the EU and others who had been clamouring for Putin's arrest. And this is despite their double standards which are on show again, when the ICC decided to indict the Prime Minister of Israel and many member of his cabinet, they went absolutely apeshit. But that's what you can expect from the US and its vassals, particularly as the US is not even a signatory to the ICC. Now, despite numerous sanctions imposed by Western countries, the Russian economy has proven very resilient and continues to grow and prosper, despite the sheer number and volume of sanctions imposed. I mean, the best efforts of the UK, uh, US in attempting to intimidate countries doing business with Russia with the threat of secondary sanctions being cut off the dollar is not working. Now, according to the World Bank report, Russia's GDP by purchasing power parity is the largest in Europe and the fourth largest in the world at approximately $6.4 trillion. 
Now, obviously, it's acknowledged that a comparison between the Russian and American co uh, economy is challenging due to the discrepancy in their respective size, according to the World Bank. I mean, the GDP of the US allegedly stands at an impressive 27.4 trillion. But given that the US economy is made up by around 60% in services and not actively producing very much of anything worthwhile, I mean, you can't eat software lawyers, bankers and hairdressers, so much of the 27 billion is created by people taking in effectively other people's laundry, and not actually producing anything worldwide. This is like Russia, which produces commodities, other goods, energy, agricultural products, and a host of other goods that people just can't live without. Now, last week, Vladimir Putin and the Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim held a cordial meeting in Vladivostok at the Eastern Economic Forum. Now, in addition to discussing international issues, the leaders of the two countries addressed the expansion of bilateral relations, including trade and investment. I mean, Prime Minister Anwar also discussed with Putin ASEAN, that's the Association of East Asian Nations, role as a pivotal point in the Asia-Pacific region and provided a comprehensive analysis of the soft power of Russia and referencing its Russian literature and its significant contributions to human history and the highlight of the country's potential to shape the future. He also commended the ascendance of uh, the BRICS, now accounting for 36% of the global GDP and over 50% of the population. And the appeal of BRICS, I mean, Br Malaysia has just formally decided to try and join BRICS and it's made its application. And the growing importance of Russia as an investment destination for Muslim majority nations. He then took the opportunity to reiterate the national motto, Malaysia, truly Asia. Now on trade. Moscow remains an important trading partner for many developing economies. That's thanks to its powerful energy sector, plus its agricultural sector and many other factors. And it's worth taking into consideration that Russia is responsible for one-tenth of global oil production and 17% of gas production, which are the primary sources of energy in the world. It's also worth noting that despite the focus on Russia's economic challenges, the country was the previously the largest trading partner of the European Union. Now, Moscow successfully redirected the substantial volumes of oil, gas and other com uh, commodities from the west to the east in a very sh short period of time. Now, Russia is now the primary supplier of energy to China and India. And this situation is particularly problematic for the US, the UK and EU. And particularly because Turkey is not only a developing country, but an important member of NATO and a potential candidate for the EU membership. So it's moving towards the BRICS uh, is a source of worry. It should be noted also that a number of countries, for example, China, Vietnam, have long-standing ties with the USSR and now with Russia. Now, as for India, Sri Lanka, Turkey and many other countries, they just declined to impose sanctions against Russia, despite Washington's strong arm in them. And they say economic considerations are the main reason. This is particular in the cases of economic difficulties that will occur by cutting off relationships with Russia. Where else can you get cheap oil and gas? Now, the overwhelming majority of countries that have maintained ties with Russia have taken a neutral stance in respect to the conflict in Ukraine, mainly because they realise that the situation is a proxy war designed to destroy Russia and affect regime change because it stood up to the US hegemon and pursues an independent foreign policy. I mean, it's not typical for Russian foreign trade partners to ignore sanctions, but to a greater or lesser extent, they do have a look at them. I mean, for example, in an interview with Bloomberg in August, the Kazakh Prime Minister, Serik Zumagarin, stated that his country will no longer blindly follow sanctions if they negatively affect Kazakh companies. I mean, it should be remembered that until the 24th of February 2022, Russia was Kazakhstan's largest trading partner. And he also highlighted that the impact of individual sanctions is more significant for Kazakhstan than for Russia. And the West has not yet compensated any of uh, Astrana for its losses. Now, it's worth taking into consideration that Moscow also exerts influence amongst developing countries with middle and low income levels. 
I mean, this was particularly evident by the widely publicised peace conference on uh, Ukraine, which took place in July in uh, Switzerland. Lots of countries chose either not to participate or only did in a formal manner, sending minor functionaries and never signed the final document. Now, despite failing to persuade all developing countries to impose sanctions on Russia, the US and Europe had asserted that neither EU or are actually threatened by the non-aligned countries' relations with Europe. They're just mad at them. I mean, this is because Moscow's avoided forming military alliances with them. In other words, the West has effectively admitted that its attempts to isolate Russia on the international stage have failed. But I efforts like the sanctions have failed because most countries realise that the US is a busted flush. And over the past 20 years, it's sanctioned one third of the countries on the planet. Yeah, one third. So no wonder the US is despised in many countries. I mean, Russia is pursuing a strategy of forging ties in the global South, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, with the objective of establishing a new, fairer, balanced world order. In this regard, it benefits from the support of an influential organisation like BRICS, which is already in a position to compete with the collective West in terms of economic strength. I mean, the Russian Foreign Ministry has expanded its strategic focus into Africa, where it's pursuing a robust and diplomatic military engagement, plus it's gaining ground against uh, competitors such as the United States and France and Africa. Now, Russia is currently serving as the chair of BRICS and the coming uh, summit in, um, in Kazan in about four weeks' time. Invitations have gone out to Mongolia, Malaysia, Venezuela, Serbia, Belarus and Vietnam and their leaders will attend the BRICS summit. Indonesia, the world's most popular, populous Muslim country, is also included. Many economists predict that uh, Indonesia will soon become uh, showing a growth trajectory like that of India. And of course, it's well expected that Erdogan of Turkey will attend as he's recently applied to join the BRICS despite being a member. Now, Indonesia, Malaysia and Vietnam present an interesting case in neutrality, not only in relation to China, but in relation to the US, international law with the ICC and the authority of the UN seems likely that these countries have passed the test as their uh, Moscow state desire to build a multipolar world is aligned with the interests of those countries and many others who are seeking an alternative uh, to the colonial uh, attitudes and bullying of the hegemonic, impudent and dictatorial approach of the US and its vassals. Now, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. If you enjoyed this video, you can help me fund the channel and the website SEO Bricks Insight by clicking on the thanks button and making a small donation. Don't forget to share uh, and also use the comments section. I love getting comments and I love responding back to you. Thank you.